All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Um, unfortunately, most of my talks are going to be uh, live coded and uh, live demoed and everything. And uh, I can only, uh, it seems like there's a little problem with the uh, HDMI, so they have to put my laptop in the back. So uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm really not sure how this is going to work, because I can either run to the back, and you can just watch the screen, or you can see me talk here, but there will be no live coding. So I'm going to let you decide on how this is going to work, all right? So see me in the back and see the screen. <laughs> OK, you don't want me to be up here. That's good. OK, that's good. That's good. I, I, I'm just going to go back and play a video, and uh, you wouldn't know that was here. All right, let's do this. All right. So we got, we, sorry for the delay. We were about 10 minutes short, and we're going to make it quick. And uh, my name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. What that means is I'm an engineer for a, a very long time. Uh, for the past uh, 15 years, I've been in the industry. And now I like to bring some of the latest and greatest technology to developers all over the world. I also love to hear about your experiences and your feedback. So the best way to do that is you know, contact me afterwards or talk to me after this session, or just find me on Twitter and uh, just direct message me. Uh, anybody can reach me if you have any questions. I love to travel. Aside from technology, I love, I love to travel and take photos. If you'd like to see some of the, the, the places I've been, uh, check out the flickr.com slash satanism. Okay. So just a very, very quick show of hand. Uh, how many people here heard about Kubernetes already? Oh, wow, everyone's here. OK, OK, very good, very good. So how many people are using it? OK, OK, uh, some, some other people are already using it. For the rest of you, why not? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> well, hope, hopefully, you'll see uh, more of uh, Kubernetes, and uh, eventually, you'll get to use it as well. So it is a container management system, a container orchestration system that was developed uh, based on the Google experience in the past with you know, what we had internally, which was called Borg. It was designed to run containers at scale on multiple, multiple machines, thousands of machines, right? So Kubernetes now can manage uh, up to 2, 3,000 nodes, uh, 2, 3,000 machines uh, in a single cluster and running your containerized workload in it. It's 100% open source, and you can run it in the cloud, on Google Cloud, or another cloud, or on-prem, or wherever you want. I run it on Raspberry Pi. I was here last year and ran it on Raspberry Pi, and that was really fun to do. Very quick uh, recap of what and how it actually works behind the scenes. You start off with a container image. The container image is like this fusion of your environment and your application put together into this giant binary, right? It will be like a giant image file, uh, but it's going to be layered, so you can actually um, uh, transfer the, the different shows uh, much, much quicker. But the, the key here is that once you have this environment with your application coding it, you can push it right into a centralized registry somewhere, and then you can write some kind of configuration to say how you want to run this app in, like, as far as well, which image you want to run, and also uh, how many instances of this application you want to run, right? And then how do you do the health checking? What, how do you handle the restarts and all that? All of those information can be captured inside of the configuration file. Then you push it to the Kubernetes master node. This is like the, the master node that controls the entire cluster. And behind the scenes, there is a scheduler, a scheduler that will be waking up periodically uh, very, very quickly and say, OK, how many instances do I need to run? And if I see that, oh, I need four instances, and I have none, then what this is going to do is to check with all the machines to see who has the capacity to run it. And if you have the capacity, it's going to go ahead and download the, uh, the image down to that machine and starting it. Okay? This is all nice. right? This is something that uh, you probably have seen before quite a lot. It's very easy. I'm not sure why this guy is flashing on me, but, <laughs> but it's very easy to do. right? Um, so now you can provision a cluster. You can, you know, just every node would look exactly the same. You don't have to worry about environments and how each machine's environment could be different anymore because all the environment is now captured in your container image. And you can just say, go ahead and kubectl run or kubectl apply with the command line, and you can just deploy these apps. So the key here really for me is that with this type of system, right, where we no longer really have to deal with the individual machines anymore. Um, basically, every line of code that I write now 
is directly contributing to the application. And when you do that, it, it's basically saying that every line of code that you write, you can much, much quickly affect the business of value or whatever that you're trying to work on rather than managing that infrastructure um, as we have done before. Uh, I had a startup before where I only have three machines. I had a startup with only three VMs, and it took a lot of time of my own time just to configure it. And at the end of the day, nobody knows how everything runs because only I know how I set it up. Even if I documented, uh, my other two teammates in the startup still wouldn't be able to get it. So uh, with this other system, we're able to actually just make sure everything looks exactly the same. People understand how to deploy and run their apps, and we can uh, deploy something much, much faster. Now, the very first thing, though, is how do you actually get started on a local environment? So I'm going to do this very quickly. I'm going to run to the back. All right, so the very first thing that you need to do with the, um, let me uh, put this down, yeah. Very first thing that you need to do to get started on the, on the local environment is by using something called the Minikube, for example. Minikube allows you to start a uh, Kubernetes cluster or a Kubernetes node locally on your machine. Uh, I think I already have something running here, so uh, let me just make sure this is big so I can't see it myself. So I have really Minikube installed. And uh, to start it, basically, I can just say uh, Minikube start. And I think I already started this. So I'm going to say Minikube status. I'm going to see uh, if it's actually run up and running. Good. Uh, what that actually means is that it's running Kubernetes behind the scenes in a VM. Now, in Minikube, we also have uh, Docker uh, installed as well. So. Rather than using your own, say, a, a separate Docker daemon, what you can do is to use a Minikube's uh, Docker daemon as well. And to get that information, you can say Minikube uh, Docker inv, and that will actually give you all of the uh, configurations you need to set in the shell. And the easiest way to set the shell is by using uh, eval. So once I eval evaluated these, um, these uh, output, basically what it does is that it exported all of these uh, environment variables, and now, whenever I do a Docker PS, I'm actually going into Minikube's Docker daemon. And what is really good is that um, now, whenever I go ahead and build an image, it's actually going to build directly into Minikube. So what that also means is that I don't have to push my image out separately uh, into a registry first in order to test it. Now I can actually test everything just locally on Minikube first. I can you know, build images as, as quickly as I want. And, um, and redeploy it as quickly as I want. I don't have to push it out separately until I'm ready. Okay? So here I have actually uh, a couple of applications I can deploy, a couple of different services. Uh, all I'm going to do right now is going to do a front end and back end. Okay? So I'm going to uh, build the back end first. And by the way, this is a Go app. So um, uh, the, all of these things are written in Go for this particular demo. And um, I, can, I have a Docker file here that describes the environment I want to do, uh, want to have, but basically I'm using a Docker unbuild. So what that means is it's going to uh, copy this Go file into the container uh, build environment, and it's going to actually build this Go file into the binary, and then putting everything into a container in one shot. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and build it. I think I have this queued up somewhere. So I'm going to say docker build dash t, uh, and I can build this uh, backend container. Oh, that was too fast. That was too fast. All right. So when something goes too fast, you just never know it's going to work, right? But this is actually building directly into my Docker daemon that is running in Minikube as well. Uh, and then if I go to the front end, I can also build the front end. So I'm going to do that. And maybe, uh, maybe I have another command line here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I just build the front end. Um, everything is local. But uh, it, the, the reason why it's so fast is because I built it before, and it's, it's kind of like cached so far, OK? And then what I can do is uh, in Minikube, uh, it actually creates a context for you, right? What is a context, right? A context is just a way for you to connect to a Kubernetes cluster. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and um, see the config. I can get contexts. And as you can see, I have many, many, many clusters running that I, I can connect to. Uh, I got so many right here. But uh, one of the, uh, the cluster that they created by default is actually uh, the Minikube uh, context. So what I'm going to do is uh, I can just use it. So I'm going to say kubectl config uh, use context uh, Minikube. Okay. And this allows me to switch directly into the Minikube context. And now whenever I say get pods, 
I'm actually using the Minikube, uh, the uh, Minikube uh, Kubernetes instance on the VM that's running locally on my machine. Uh, I can also start, for example, a proxy. I'm going to say uh, start the Minikube proxy. Sorry. And then uh, let's go in and see the visualization. And in this visualization tool, uh, I'm actually seeing that I have a cluster. I have a cluster, but um, it only has one node. Okay. So how do we actually deploy this app? Well, um, for development purposes, I like to use uh, just kubectl run. So for example, I can go ahead and do uh, kubectl run. I, want, I can run the backend. So I just give it a name. And I give it the, the image I want to run. And let's go ahead and run it. There you go, running Minikube, running inside of Minikube right now. And I can also run the front end as well. There you go. And I should have started the front end. Uh, all of these things are now running locally on my machine. And I can actually go and test one of these things. So for example, oh, I, if I want to test uh, to use the back end, uh, there are a few things I can do. Right? For example, I can say uh, get pod. And I know where the back end is, and I can connect to it. Uh, there are multiple ways for you to do this. Um, if you just want to test things out, you can open a port forward. So what that means is I can uh, open a, a tunnel directly from my local machine, and I can forward this uh, into oh, port forward, forward, there we go. I can connect directly into this pod or this in, uh, application instance. Hopefully, uh, I can say 9,000. There we go. And then I can say uh, API next. And that's uh, hitting the back end. And basically what this API does is to return a random string uh, every time I, I run it. And uh, it's saying uh, stay calm, uh, don't panic, which is something I need to do right now. All right. So we can do that. But then we can also expose a load balancer. We can expose services. So for example, I can create a service. Uh, in Kubernetes, service is the way for you to create a load balancer in front. So you can load balance across multiple instances, for example. So here I can go ahead and create a load balancer uh, for the front end. It's going to be listening on port 80. And it's going to uh, go to the target port 80 as well. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. And I can also expose the, the back end as well. So let me see if I can pull that up. So I got both the front end and the back end exposed now. Okay. Now, this is cool because if I say kubectl, get the VC, uh, I can see that I got two services running, but they're all having a cluster IP. What that means is that these things are only accessible from within the cluster at this very moment. But because I actually exposed it as a uh, 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 node port, uh, what that means is that if I want to access it, I can actually access it from the Minikube's IP and uh, go to the node port, which is uh, one of the ports that's exposed uh, on the Minikube IP. And that port will then forward to the actual port of the container. This is the load balance port. Uh, there is an easy way for you to get to this port, which is to use the Minikube code Minikube service. And I can say, let me open up the button masher uh, backend. Okay. And hopefully, that's going to pop this open. Yeah. So if you look closely, you actually get the IP for myself uh, automatically. And then also determines that this is a node port. I need to connect to this node uh, on this specific port. Now, this port is actually dynamically assigned. Uh, you can assign a static port if you want to. But to avoid conflicts, it's usually dynamically assigned. And I can, of course, go into the API. And I should be able to see everything here. Okay. So that is how I can actually uh, do some of the testing. But then I need to test the front end. So I'm going to go ahead and open the front end as well, front end. OK, so in the front end, I can see that I have the UI, and I got this button I can click. Oh, shoot. Huh. There's nothing. It's not actually calling the API. I wonder what is happening. Let me open this up. And if I go to the network uh, and do a refresh, let me see. Yeah. Ba, ba, ba. Ah. Aha. I see the issue here. The problem here is that um, I'm actually expecting the API to be accessible from a relative directory. Right? This is a relative URL. So uh, what that means is I'm actually expecting that API next is uh, available underneath the, the same domain. But it's not there right now because I'm running the two services uh, separately. right? Because if you look back to this, this uh, view, I have the service here. I got the service there. They have different IP addresses. So I cannot really get to it via relative path. And in Kubernetes, there is uh, actually a really nice construct, uh, which is called ingress. 
Now, typically, what happens in this case, if you're using a, a regular stack, uh, for, for example, if you're using Spring or Spring Boot, uh, you, you probably need to run what we call the API gateway, right? Something that fronts the all of the services, it responds to a proxy the directory or a URL, and then forwards the, date, uh, the request to the actual backend. In Kubernetes, we can actually create the ingress. This is going to create a real L7 load balancer. It's going to be an HTTP load balancer. And for each of the different uh, URLs, you can actually map it to the actual service backend that needs to respond to this request. Okay? So in Minikube, I can also deploy this kind of uh, load balancer as well. But before you do it, I have to enable the add-ons. So in Minikube, there are many, many different add-ons you can have. For example, kubeDNS, Hipster, uh, Ingress, uh, Add-on Manager, Dashboard, and so, such and such. Uh, but for you to enable the add-on like Ingress, all you have to do is to say add-ons enable Ingress. And what that's going to do is to deploy a local version of uh, Nginx that can act and listen to these Ingress resources and creating these Ingress uh, load balancers. Now, I already have it enabled. What that means is that I can go ahead and say apply F, and uh, I can apply this Ingress file, and that should create the Ingress for me. And if I'm lucky today, I can say get Ingress. Oh, I cannot type from back here. Uh, I sh it's going to expose an IP address, and this will take like a few seconds to provision because because it needs to sync up. Whoa, sync up on the uh, on the on the um, uh, the backend. But once it is provisioned, uh, I should be able to go there, and now I can actually access my app. And because I proxied the API next URL, so now I can also go to this ingress IP, and I can go directly. Uh, into this uh, directory, okay, into this URL. All right, very good. So now I'm uh, running everything locally. I'm testing everything out locally. What do I need to do to deploy it uh, into someone else's computer, in this case, into, into the cloud? Well, first of all, you can just create another Kubernetes uh, cluster. I have already one created, and that is uh, that's a five-node cluster, so I'm going to bring that up. And for me to switch to a different cluster, uh, if, if I want to have this as a default setting, all I need to do is to, again, use the config. I'm going to use the context, uh, and I can use my demo cluster, for example. But before I do it, I need to kind of export my configurations. So what I can do is I can do a kubectl get uh, deployments, for example. And I got two different deployments here. I got the back end and the front end. So I can actually just get the deployment, and I'm going to output as a YAML file and, uh, in the export mode. And if I do this, I can just uh, pipe it. Oh, here we go, get deployments. Uh, export and uh, OYAML, so I can get the YAML file. I'm going to pipe it into my deployments on YAML. Okay? And sim similarly, I'm going to also export my services. So I'm going to get my services. I'm going to get the back end service and the front end service. And then I'm going to do the export. I'm going to get OYAML. And then I can output it into services YAML. Okay? Very good. So if I open this out, Right, it, it should have all of the configuration that I have done previously, um, all exported. And this is a really easy way to move from you know, your development environment uh, potentially into the cloud or in, into a real environment uh, is by bootstrapping some of these YAML files because these are the configurations you need to write. You can write it by hand, or in my case, I just like to generate it. And once it's generated, I can clean this up a little bit. Right? I can remove some of these things I don't need, uh, specifically that I don't want to have. And uh, in the cloud, uh, sometimes I don't want the node port to be dynamically assigned. So I'm just going to uh, create uh, the node port. I'm going to assign the node port explicitly in this case. Um, and let me see here. What else do I need to change? The cluster IP, I need to remove that, right? And node port, I'm going to use uh, 30,080 in this case, OK? So I can do all my changes here to make sure that this is something I can deploy into the cloud. But in most cases, you don't really have to change anything. I just decided to make the node port static just so I can expose it across multiple clusters later. OK? So I'm going to do that. And um, now I can switch my context to not Minikube, but I'm going to go to demo. Okay? And if I reset my visualization tool, now if I go back, to the visualizer, I am in the cloud. Now I'm in a Kubernetes cluster that has five nodes rather than just one. And how would this actually work? Well, I exported the YAML file 
the configuration file from my local environment in this case. I did all my changes and settings so that I know that this is the, the configuration I want to run in a multi-node uh, cluster, which you know I didn't really change much. But having not done, I can just go ahead and apply F. And I'm going to say deploy the uh, deployment and then deploy the uh, services YAML, and I can deploy both. And hopefully that's going to get created um, and deployed into the right environment. There you go. Okay. So now I'm, I literally just took whatever I was working on on my local laptop, right, in Minikube environment, and I just exported all the settings. And now I'm actually running in a multi-node environment without changing just about anything in this case, right? I can also go ahead and create an ingress and um, and expose everything via the public IP. Uh, everything would just work exactly the same. Okay. Now. That will get you to the cloud. That, that would just be, um, now it's not bad, right? Now you have potentially a production environment. But some of the businesses actually have to deal with global traffic, right? How do we actually do that? Okay. So what we have done so far is to basically uh, take a configuration, we can deploy it into a cluster of machines, right? Effectively, what we're seeing is that we're looking at the entire one data center or a pool of resources as a one view. We're seeing rather than just individual machines, we're seeing, you know, in aggregate, how much CPU and memory do I, do I have? Uh, individual machines doesn't really stand out anymore. It's about the cluster. So the next step is to actually, you know, take it a step further and say, well, what happens if we take the same abstractions and we say, you know what? I don't really care about which data center anymore. Uh, all I want to do is to deploy this and deploy this globally across the world. And to do that, you have to have deal with multiple, multiple data centers, uh, regional data centers, for example, or within multiple zones. So what we have done so far is that we're able to control servers or machines through a single control plane via, you know, via the Kubernetes master. And the master node exposes the API. You can use the client library. You can use the user interface to interact with this master node. And then subsequently, that affects every single machine that's under its control. If we take this even a step further, then we can also create a control plan that will be able to control not the machines, but control individual clusters. Okay? Because each cluster will expose the API endpoint, and we control the cluster via the API. So, if we have another abstraction on top of that, then we can create another control plane that will operate against each, in, each one of these clusters via the API as well. So now you can deploy Kubernetes potentially on multiple uh, on-prem clusters. You can deploy Kubernetes on, on the cloud, on another web services cloud. I don't know what that stands for, but let's just suppose you deploy it onto two different cloud platforms. It doesn't matter where you deploy it. They all expose the API. And through the control plane, we can actually control the deployment across Different, uh, different clusters. And in many cases, this is used in order to deploy this across multiple regions. Okay? And how would that actually work? Well, first, we need to install this control plan. And that is called Cube, um, uh, that is the uh, federation control plan. And out of all the clusters that you may want to federate, in this, in this view, we have the e US East, US Central, uh, a data center in Europe, and a data center in Asia, right? Out of these four, clusters, we actually have to pick one of them as the host cluster. The host cluster is the, actually the one that runs the control plane for the federation, because you have to run the federation API and the federation controller somewhere, and you have to pick one of the clusters to run it. Now, what I have actually created is um, I created um, a, a, a simple project. Let me see if I can open it. So I can, so consolecloud.google.com. Um, I created a project called, um, KubeFed World. I'm going to well, zoom in here a little bit. So there's a, there's a project I created on Google Cloud. In this case, that's where I'm running in my clusters. And uh, if I go to Container Engine, in this case, this is a managed container service that we have. I actually have two clusters. Each cluster has three nodes. And each cluster uh, is running in a different zone. So I got a cluster running in Europe, um, right around here, around Belgium area. And I got another cluster in the United States, in the central region, OK? So I got two clusters running right now. Uh, I should be able to open up the visualization around them as well. So I'm going to do exactly that. So I'm going to open the visualizer. So that visualizer goes to, uh, let me see here. Ba, 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 ba. 
So the first visualizer, the one at the bottom goes to Europe, OK? And then um, I need to get another visualization up, which is this one. And this visualization tool on the top is going to go to US Central, OK? So the top one is going to the US. The bottom visualization is going to, uh, to Europe right now, OK? So how do I actually use Federation to, to kind of deploy pretty much the same application uh, to, to across multiple clusters? Well, first, I need to install that federation control plan. Okay? Now, it is a little bit more involved, so what I'm going to do is to uh, use a little node here. Okay? So I'm going to, I never really done this before, uh, you know, using a lot of nodes, but uh, for federation, I kind of I kinda need to do that. Okay? So let me see here, cat, step, uh, federation. So there are a few things I need to do. Uh, first of all, is I need to initialize this federation control plan. Now, in order for everything to work, you actually need to have a real DNS name. Okay? This is, um, you know, for testing purposes, you can have something that doesn't really exist, but that only goes as far as uh, being able to control the deployment across multiple clusters. Uh, later in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about cluster uh, federated uh, service. This will be a, a federated service which allows you to do cross cluster discovery. And if you want to do a cross cluster service discovery, then you have to have a real working domain. And this is actually working right now. So I actually registered this domain name. Okay? So first, I'm going to go ahead and initialize this federation. So I'm going to go ahead and deploy this uh, feder uh, federation control plan. What this command do, this kubefed command is pretty new. It actually makes the installation of federation a lot easier. What this is doing right now is to connect to the host cluster, which is the US central uh, cluster, which is right here, the central cluster with three nodes. Um, and then it's going to uh, install the control plan into the federation namespace. So it's going to create a new federation system name namespace. And it's going to install the API server. It's going to install the control uh, federation controller, and also create some basic configuration so that it can interact with my uh, DNS. Now, in order to interact with the DNS, we actually have to give it the provider, like who actually controls the DNS. Uh, you actually need some kind of plugin for this. So right now, there is a support for Google's cloud DNS and the, uh, the Route 53. Uh, and also that if you run this on-prem, you can probably look into CoreOS's uh, Core DNS. So you can run Core DNS locally uh, in an on-prem environment. Now, the DNS is important because uh, whenever that we create a new service from this on forward, if the service has an external IP address, we can use the DNS entries to kind of point to which IP address uh, this should be running, uh, this should be connecting to. Okay? So it actually uses the DNS APIs to update DNS entries uh, whenever you deploy new applications into this federation. Okay? So it took a little time, but now we have the control plane installed on my cluster. To look at it, I can say, uh, let me switch the context. Uh, rather than switching the default context, I'm just going to go and use um, the context for this specific command. I'm going to specify it. I'm going to say uh, this is kubefed, US central. And I can get my namespaces, and I should be able to see that a federation systems namespace is created. And I can get the pods. So I can say uh, namespace is equal to federation dash system. And we should be able to see that we have two, uh, two pods running. One of them is API, the other one is controller manager. Okay? So now we can actually join up into this federation. So I'm going to go back to this slide a little bit. For each of the cluster you want to have participating in the federation, you have to you know, explicitly join. And by joining, I mean that you actually have to pass the credentials that is necessary to connect to the cluster into the federation control plane. Okay? So every of the clusters will have a context. The context will point to my credentials. So what I need to do then is to make sure that my credentials is actually registered with the uh, the federation control plan. And I can do that by using the QFED command line as well. So in this case, I can say uh, QFED, I need to join into a federation. I need to join my central cluster into this federation. Uh, so I can just do that. I'm going to copy and paste it. Okay. So literally, what happened before the, behind the scenes is I took my US central credential, it actually gave it to my federation server and also registered it in the API server as well. And I can do very similar things for uh, my US West. Now, hold on a second. I think I saw a little 
problem here because da, ba, 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 that is definitely not the right name of the context, right? So it's uh, actually cube fed dash eu uh, dash west. I think that should be right, okay? So I'm going to register my eu federation, uh, eu cluster as well. Now, once I've done that, I should be able to see the status of whether these clusters are now being recognized by the federation. So what I can do is I can use my federation context. I can get clusters, and I should see two clusters uh, being registered. Now, only one of them is ready. The other one is unknown. So I actually have to wait for both of them to be ready. And now, now this is cool. Now I have two clusters, one in the Europe, one in the US, and I can control everything uh, all my deployment uh, directly from these two, uh, directly from this federation, okay? So let me, let's do an example. Uh, I'm gonna go back here and da 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 da, laptop to the world. Right, remember we exported the service, we exported the deployment. I was able to deploy those two things into a single cluster. Uh, I can now deploy literally the exact same thing into the federation as well. Uh, the only thing I may want to change is the low balancer, the type. I'm going to change it to low balancer in this case. Uh, the only reason for this is because I want to show you a cross-cluster uh, service discovery, okay? In order to do that, I actually have to expose my services via an external IP, and the way to do that in Kubernetes is by exposing it as a type of low balancer, okay? So I'm going to do that, and now I can say, rather than deploying into my demo cluster, I can now deploy it into my federation. So if everything goes wrong, well, I should be able to say context. Oh, shoot, that's my, that's my uh, auto-completion. I'm going to say apply dash s. I'm going to apply services. And then uh, let's see how it works. Uh, crossing my fingers. I'm going to move this to this view so you can see it. OK, there we go. Oh, yeah, of course. So what happened is that in the Federation namespace, it doesn't really understand the default, that there's a namespace called default. So I actually have to create it. So I'm going to say create uh, default namespace. Yeah, OK. And once I'm done that, the Federation server now understands all the clusters will have to have a default namespace. Uh, now I can go ahead and create the service. And if I'm lucky today, uh, it's not bad, you can actually see that the service is actually provisioned into both clusters, OK? And they all have a different IP, of course, because they are physically different clusters, right? But it now it's actually provisioned. And I did it in one shot via the federation. Now, if I go back to here and say get service uh, using the federation context, uh, I can see that we're still waiting for the external IP addresses to provision. So I'm going to wait for that a little bit. But in the meantime, what I can do is I can actually go and check out what happened in the DNS. So if I go to Cloud DNS um, into networking, OK, so I can go into networking and go to Cloud DNS, I have here a zone that I created for my subdomain, a demo kubefed.world. I can go in there. And um, you can actually see that now the entries for these uh, services are actually being created. I have a backend. And um, I should also see a front end uh, shortly as well. But these are going to be just created automatically. But what's interesting is that there's actually no IP addresses associated with these uh, DNS names. That is because I don't have any backends running. All I did is I created the load balancer. I just created the, the, the load balancing um, I, um, uh, services behind the scenes, but there's actually no backend applications that's running. So Federation does something really smart. If you deploy the backend into one of the regions, one of the clusters, then it's going to recognize that this cluster can now serve this application because now I have the backend. Then it's going to automatically register IP address into the DNS name as well. And now all of a sudden, you can actually entrust the service discovery to the DNS server, right? Because you can say, let me access button match your backend uh, in my Federation and this will actually be updated with the IP addresses that actually serves the actual request, OK? So let's see uh, if all my services can back up with the IP addresses. Yes, I have done that. OK, very good. I got both the front end and back end. And if I do a little refresh, I should see uh, front end back end as well. Yeah, good. So I got front end and back end. 
All right, so let's go ahead and deploy. So I had this deployment right here, right? It's exactly the same file. I haven't cheated or anything. It's exactly the same file. So I'm going to say kubectl context is equal to federation. I'm going to apply this deployment. Ah, this, this auto completion thing is not liking the equal sign. All right, F, I'm going to say deploy this, all right? So let's see, let's see how it works today, all right? So I did a deployment and into the, my federation, and hopefully, very quickly, soon enough, I should be able to see, ah, there we go, not bad. Ah, check this out. So now I have my backend deployed uh, in the top, so that's the US cluster, uh, but it's not in, the front end is not there yet, and that's fine. And then I have the back end, uh, or I have the front end deployed in the EU, it's running one instance, but there's no back end. That's only because I only, I'm only running one instance of each thing, right? So I can actually scale. So I can also say context federation. I can scale my deployment. Uh, I can scale my button masher backend. I can say, you know, replica is equal to, say, four or right, two, four. Let's do four. Okay. And uh, let me scale my front end. Uh, maybe the front end doesn't need as much process things, I'm going to, say, scale that to two. So again, without having to go to each of the clusters individually, I'm now doing this via the, uh, basically via the federation. And you can see now that the federation server actually figured out, oh, I got to run four. I need to have some kind of balance between the two clusters. And so rather than running all of them on a single cluster, I'm going to balance them out. So now I'm running two instances in the US, and I'm running two instances in the EU. Now, on the other side, for the front end, I'm running two instances. So now I have one instance of each uh, in each of the cluster, right? You can actually configure the weight as well, because not every cluster has the same size. Some clusters could be less powerful than the other. So you can actually configure this through the, the, the annotations as well. You can actually say that, hey, you know, Cluster A is bigger, so I'm going to put more pods there. I'm going to run more instances there. You can control that directly through the annotation, right? And I can deploy everything else. I can, de I can deploy the ingress and everything else. Uh, I have another one that's already deployed. So I'm going to go there right now. And you can, you can also go to this URL, okay? This is called uh, hcr.kas.io, okay? This is the same application. I just have it deployed earlier. Uh, it would be kind of nice if you can go and check it out, okay? And in this deployment, if you actually open up the URL, uh, if you press the buttons a little bit, OK, this is fun. Uh, no one's pressing. I don't, I don't know why. But uh, if you press, I should be able to see the QPS coming through, OK? So you can go to hcr.ksil, and if you press the button, we'll be able to see your QPS, OK? And yes, uh, everybody's clicking now. That's awesome. That's good. All right, keep on clicking. Do not stop. I'm just kidding. Um, but but you can see that all the traffic right now is actually going to, somebody scripted it. So, I think somebody scripted this to, uh, to try to DDoS my, my backend. <laughs> but keep, keep on doing that. This is going to be over shortly, all right? But th you can, as you can see, all of this traffic is going to just the US cluster at this moment. I have three clusters, but all of them is going to the US. That is only because I have one version, uh, one instance running, OK? What I can do is, let me get back to my shell, OK? What I can do is, um, since it's a federation, I can go ahead and scale it. So I'm going to say kubectl, scale. My deployment, uh, I think it's called the hello world, uh, sorry, not the hello world, sorry, uh, button masher backend. So I'm going to spin this up to six, OK? So I'm going to do that scale. And actually, you know what? Before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and, and do a, a deployment of the load balancer, uh, sorry, the load tester, OK? So what I can do here is I can deploy, I can use federated deployment, and I can use what we call the federated name discovery or service discovery, and I can just use a DNS name. Okay, this DNS name is pretty smart. What it's going to do is to resolve to the nearest services that's actually serving. So nearest cluster that has the service uh, serving. So what that means is if I'm referencing to this DNS name because I only have I only have the application running in the US. This is going to resolve to the United States IP address. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and deploy this. Federation cluster apply dash F. 
loaders deployment.yaml. Okay, so what this is going to do is to spin out three instances of my load bot. Each of the load bot is going to generate about 1,000 QPS. And once this is up and running, I should be able to see uh, 3,000 QPS being, uh, being uh, uh, there we go, being opened up. And yeah, sorry, whoever is doing the clicking, I'm sorry, I don't see your clicks anymore. But, but now we are seeing 3,000 QPS. Now, here's the, the most beautiful part. Because it's using cross-cluster service discovery, what that means, again, is if I'm actually having backends running in Asia, running in the EU, uh, it should actually find its local services. It should, rather than coming across the, the ocean to the US, they should actually stick within their own data center. So I can simulate that very quickly. So what I can do is I can go ahead and scale my deployment. This will be done in a second. Okay, Scale my deployment, and um, I'm going to up my button masher backend. I'm going to scale this up to uh, six instances. Let's do that. Now watch carefully. Watch carefully, because it's going to be done very, very quickly. All right. So the clusters are synchronizing up. So it's probably going to run two instances of each in each of the, uh, the clusters. There we go, six instances. Now watch. The low bot, the low bot that was using a federated you know, service discovery mechanism, so as soon as there's something running locally, it actually split the traffic very quickly, right? Because now the service discovery is saying, yeah, you know what? Rather than going across the ocean, just go to your own. So we can see that the, the traffic for each of these things just split. And now they're all going to their local data center, which is pretty awesome, right? Now, last thing I'm going to mention is that behind the scenes, I also set up an ingress, and this is pretty cool. So rather than using network load balancer, I can actually create, again, the L7 load balancer, which is what we call the ingress. Now, with the ingress, uh, it's actually, um, depending on where you are, uh, but on Google Cloud, it, the ingress will be created with just one single IP address, OK? One single IP. So I can show you what that IP is. Blah, 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 blah. Scale, let me just now do this quickly. Get deployment. Uh, sorry, get ingress. OK? And that's going to have an IP address here, right? That is actually what you're hitting with the, this URL. So rather than going into the, the local you know, network discovery with the network load balancer, I can use this ingress too. And I'm going to go ahead and edit my deployment of my load bots. Uh, I'm going to use the context federation cluster. OK. Oh, keep CTO. And this will be done very quickly. And rather than going into my local service discovery, I'm going to use uh, hcr.ks.io. And the port, I'm going to use port 8080. Again, this is a federal deployment, so it's going to update on my load bot to use, rather than the ex internal load balancer, it's going to use the external one now through the ingress. Okay? And that should be done. Okay, so now all the traffic is coming through through the ingress. Now here's the, beauty, the beautiful part. You can still see that each of the, um, the, the clusters are still receiving approximately the same load, even though I'm going through the same uh, external load balancer. Oh, there we go. So now it's a little bit different. Okay. Now check this out. Azure is gone. Azure is now zero QPS. We have 2,000 in EU and 1,000 in US. The reason for that is because through the ingress, uh, currently, uh, my load bot is just running in Asia now. I got two instances of the load bots running in Asia. And so the ingress, even though it's a single IP, it actually routes the traffic also to the nearest uh, servers as well. Okay? So this is one of the ways for you to literally deploy multi-region deployments. And you know, having a global load balancer set up, and now you can route the traffic depending on where you are. You can actually route the traffic to the nearest uh, data centers without having to do a lot of work. Okay? So I know my time is up. I really appreciate you, uh, you know, attending, and also uh, um, apologize I wasn't in the front. But uh, um, if you have any questions or if you want to see some of these things working, um, you can actually try a lot of these things. Uh, I just want to put up the last slide here so you can find out where you can find the information. Okay? So all of the code is online. You can find them on, on my GitHub. You can set up Minikube. Uh, just download it on your local machine. And you can try the federation now in my collab as well. You can open the, the document, and you can go to the collab. So thank you, very, thank you so much for your time. And again, apologies for uh, starting late. So thank you. Cheers. <laughs>